four days of lectures, so I'm trying to condense it in 30 minutes, so so hang on. With, we're going to have, I can, um, <laughs> I can give you questions, I can answer questions after uh, segments. I'll be st talking about fire and hydrology and their interactions, how water affects fire. I'll be talking about the, um, the wa water cycle and also I'll be talking about how to read land or landscape analysis where you can find opportunities to utilize water and then those applications in order to facilitate that those applications and so I'll start with fire and hydrology and fire is a you know if we're looking at a high intense fire how does it get to that point well there's a few factors there's what we we have what what components of fire do we have we have fuel and fuel is all our materials that burn obviously we got some right here and the quality of the fuel is determined by other factors as we can see this fuel doesn't burn so easily because it's wet you know everyone knows a wet fireplace does not burn as easily um, what factors increase it that can turn that that wet fuel into a dryer is our wind and oxygen so as wind enters a landscape that helps dry it out it makes those materials drier and more liable to burn and that process is called preheating so basically we're priming those fuel into conditions of, of lower or higher intensity so the more preheating that occurs the higher that intensity so preheating can happen with winds drying it out, with lack of living ground cover, and of course other events, other fire events coming in and drying out in uh, producing conditions. So in that respect, fire resiliency is not just about your property. It's about getting together with your community, ensuring we're all on the same page on how to manage fire properly. If we make all the conditions here perfect for not inducing that preheating and creating the fire event. Well, if my neighbor and this neighbor and that neighbor aren't really doing that or even increasing the, the vulnerability, then much of the work we're doing won't, won't really pan out. So we have to all work together. So how does water help reduce those well obviously you know water logging something can really slow that fire but uh, so decaying and organic materials that are rotting on the ground also have less chance of burning and we can look at a few diagrams I'm gonna kind of bounce between these two so uh, let me talk about fire intensity a little more where this is the shape of the land on a cross cut. It's what you call a gully or a ravine. And we actually have a couple here. And so you'll have your vegetation on the sides of the steep slopes. And what happens with fire, it will want to go through these as fire alleys and corridors. So this actually intensifies the winds funnels it, dries out those materials into preheating conditions, and they can combust. Now with the elevation, it exacerbates that. You have more of a problem because as the steepness of the slope increases, the speed of that fire also, because it's more vertical, so it gains more fuel as it goes up and just gets higher and higher. That's what happened with the ridge very much. Um, However, hydrology really limits that hydrology, the study of waters. I should be more <laughs> defining here. 
And if we look at the water cycle, that really helps us determine that. So we can start from the top of a ridge or mountain, and we could see various effects. But let's start at the bottom where evaporation begins. So at the bottom, as in a basin, a lake, a sea, or a low valley with wetlands and such, such as our rice fields down here, a lot of this water turns into vapor called evaporation and then forms clouds. The wind currents push it, especially here in California, they push it to the east and that butts up against mountains. So with trees and other plants along the way, they basically perspire or sweat water. It's called transpiration. So they're breathing out water and it's also collecting to clouds. And once it gets to this rise and there's a sufficient amount of vegetation, it will condense and start raining. The raining will keep all these plant communities healthy, but also it will infiltrate into the ground, into the groundwater layer, and it will also run off, uh, run off into our circuit of water from starting from what's called headwaters, where you first start to see that water flow down into streams and rivers and so on. I'll get more into that. So what happens if we remove some of this vegetation? So we just go and clear all this for whatever reasons. And it's a nice place for something else, I guess. Well, we actually end up losing some of these clouds, right? Because they're not they're not breathing that water out into the atmosphere. So we're losing our rainfall is declining. So these plant communities can't survive as much. So now we have less chance to collect that water. We have less of a cycle to bring those clouds and then it creates those dry conditions. So we have to maintain this cycle, and we can make examples of that within our landscape. Obviously, I don't have control of the valley or anything, or the, or the sea or whatever, but we can maintain moisture, such as with these trees, they shade, and they help keep this soil from evaporating, from the water from the surface coming up to the air. So, one more thing about water I want to talk about is how plants help retain that and help reduce fire. So, we've got our groundwater here. This is an example crosscut. We have little herbaceous annual plants. So, some plants have different roots, and they got the tap root that goes deep down and it starts getting that water. Some have fine roots up top and they help with the erosion. But, and there's trees that go deeper and often hit that groundwater. All of them will basically pull water. They search for the water, but they also pull it towards them. And basically the action of them breathing helps draw that water out. Now you may think, oh, they're just losing all that water, but they maintain the water table. And in fact, that groundwater with enough plant communities and enough of a water cycle will raise. So we'll be raising that groundwater. In the Central Valley, I'd hear old farmers say, well, back in the day, I could sink a T-post and all the water would just spurt out. Also back in the day, they would say, you could walk from Visalia to Fresno completely covered in the shade because of all the riparian oak trees that were still built. So what happens when you log it? You get Bakersfield. <laughs> well, it's true because Bakersfield has lost a lot of its um, vegetation and is continuously drying. Any of that rain, basically evaporates before it hits the ground table. 
And this is happening throughout the valley. I don't want to single out Bakersfield, but <laughs> so is there any questions on this subject? Yeah. So, so something I didn't quite communicate was what's called like fire ladders, and I don't need a whiteboard to show you fire ladders. <laughs> um, we've been doing our best to clear this land. Basically, all the clear spots you see, except for down in the meadow, that's the work we did, and everything else looked just like the big thick uh, thickets that we see here. So when it's standing up. It's bringing that fire and increasing the elevation. Eventually, they'll get to the canopy. Mm -hmm. If you chop it, lop it, do small burns, especially with some species that emerge right after fires and start dominating, you'll see very. You'll see a lot of manzanita. You'll see what's called deer bush or ceanothus. Mm -hmm. Those come up after fire. They get really thick and they thrive in in fire conditions. So with low intensity burning. You're actually killing a lot of those those young sprouts, and in addition to chopping and lopping or grazing and bringing those the dead brush down to decompose and to burn at a low intensity with the right weather conditions, you you can actually rebuild that fertility and maintain the hydrology. You don't you don't burn every year. Mm -hmm. um, you know it depends on the landscape. They may be every three years, it may be every 10 years. And then there's different um, techniques you can use, such as the grazing and, and the chop and drop. So can that, what's happening here, can that be revert? Like can uh, it happen in reverse? Like say the top layers, how we see in here with the fires burning all those trees on the hilltops, now is that gonna degrade the lower valley as yeah, with, yeah, so with, um, you can, just, just to um, answer that fire can travel downhill with appropriate winds and with enough fuel, if the right conditions are, it can send down, but the real degradation is the soil structure and the loss of plant communities. So what happens with a high intensity fire, it actually changes the soil. And it becomes, a lot of it like just evaporates in the air or it evaporates partially and then just makes this layer which actually is water repellent. So you get massive erosion after an intense fire. So all that, obviously all the, the structure pollutants and then the runoff silting the, the rivers and streams can cause damages downstream. What I think I understood when I was talking to the people about the fires, because we had a couple um, expert kind of that girls here looking at what was possible for us to burn or not, mm -hmm. and um, those fires are not high intensity fires, right. so they're not scorching the earth, and they're adding like that ash back in, mm -hmm. and then they're getting rid of things you don't really want that. And so that the things that you do want growing can come back. So what I was listening to a girl, or I think it was a guy, on our fire and fungi class, and he was saying, um, he was from Santa Cruz area, that after they burned, like that, they, he said none of the hills down there ever looked in before um, they got infiltrated with. European people look like they do now and they keep these big meadows and after they burned a whole bunch of medicinal plants would come back. There'd be like a succession of things that they wanted um, that they burned purposely mm -hmm. for because those things liked fire. <laughs> yeah, I just want to add like uh, I'm working for the Forest Service for like seven years fighting fires. A lot of this is not real common knowledge. Like mostly what we would do is a lot of prescribed burns, clearing out a lot of manzanita from the middle of Mendocino National Forest and stuff like that, that really burns intensely like that. And project work, just taking them out with glass knees and whatnot. 
but it's not super common knowledge like um the hydrology stuff and stuff like that we learn about you know a lot of fire you know fire intensities and light fuels creating heavy fuels you know and that but yeah i've only done a few prescribed burns feel free to contribute your knowledge with with fire i really appreciate it so now that we've got it more or less understood with fire and water and their interactions i want to talk about how to read the land in order to understand points that you can utilize water. Um, so we have not much space here. I gotta erase something. <laughs> I'm gonna erase oh, this. I wish I could. <laughs> I, I, I couldn't, so you know, I love him too, and I love plants, so Aww. here we go. <laughs> a balance where sometimes if everything is barren like just you decide to make your entire property dry and just kill all the plants on the ground it dries up that soil too mm -hmm. so and it also disturbs that soil and it invites plants that burn high like our invasive cheatgrass so there's definitely a balance involved that you need to have a defensive space definitely Mm -hmm. And but in your perimeter, you have to consider maintaining that hydrology through plants and through mulch. And there's different ways to do that. But isn't it better to have like lush and green stuff around your house if you're going to have stuff instead of just like a hundred feet of nothing? Yeah, as long as you can keep them watered and healthy, and they won't dry out, certainly. And most of the time, as I'll explain later. Um, the plant communities help hold that water. So with landscape analysis, we, um, we can read different parts of the terrain and see where the best parts are to start collecting water. This is a cross section of a slope into a valley. And how I can read this, there's two terms I wanna bring up. There's what's called the inflection point. The inflection point is when you have this convex dome lens shape of, of a slope of a hill, and then it turns, as it goes into the valley, into a bowl or convex. So your, your inflection point is basically right there on the middle. This is, um, with, with experience, you can see it in the landscape. Eventually, you can just pop it, like, oh, there it is, if you're, if you're practicing and such. And it's a good place to start looking at dynamics. A lot of times, at this point, you start seeing different plant communities. You start seeing shrubs and lower things. And as you get higher, you may see more trees, or if it's a drier landscape like chaparral, the drier stuff like manzanita and such. But down just below, let's show the direction of water. This is runoff. So all the water coming off of the surface will start to settle at some point, right past the key point. Let me write that down. So where it settles, oh, I just skipped ahead. This is the inflection point. This is the key point. So the key point is right where water stops becoming an erosive force. The water goes so fast, its velocity as it goes down a steep slope, without, especially with plant communities that anchor that in, will start eroding. But once it starts settling, it's no longer causing damage, it's starting to hydrate. So inflection points help you read where those, there's great opportunities to 
start your waterworks like a swale. The swale we're doing today is more or less on a key point relative to our property. If I wanted to look at the entire landscape, we'd actually be a bit ways down here. But looking at what we got to work with, this is the most optimal place where we've been seeing water settle. This is all based on observation. It's like, oh, that's the spot, and just plot it down. So, with a slope in the valley, you can create, you can have an inflection point that creates a key point, and the key point is a great place to start considering how to move water. Now, what are our features? Have you ever looked at a uh, topographic map and see all these squiggly lines? Is when I when I met when I looked at it, I was like. I don't understand. Is that going down? Is that going up? And um, I'll just show you the top of a ridge. So this is the ridge. And then these lines represent increments going down every 10 feet or some usually 50 feet on most of the online maps. But you can read different places where water starts moving just by looking at a map like this. So from the top of the ridge line, we've got rain, but there's actually this kind of hairpin section here, you see, and that is the presence of a gully or a ravine. It's that depression in the hills that you see. And as you can look around you, you see all the trees collecting because that's where all the water is concentrating. Of course, if it's dry, we get the fire alley. So with ravines and gullies, that's also a good place where we can find maybe a bit downhill, there's that, there's that um, inflection point. I haven't talked about this one quite yet. So from land to sea, we got our headwaters. I talked briefly about how that's the beginning where water starts flowing. And a lot of times that will also be kind of a key point, maybe a bit higher up. You may want to put earthworks just a bit downstream from these. As the water concentrates and forms streams, <laughs> it'll continue down and concentrate further as it reaches the valley. And when it's, it starts slowing down, it meanders animal and plant communities like beavers, uh, willows and such will start interacting with it. And eventually as you get to the lowlands into the delta, it once again spreads out into this fan. This fan pattern is something to really observe. You'll see all water systems start as these little tiny, little tiny rivulets and streams in a fan shape or dendritic patterns as it's called and uh, concentrate into a flow when it's conducive and then as it slows down it'll fan out again. So these are important dynamics to understand where let's say on this property we have many little streams connecting and the goal with the earthworks is to concentrate them almost like a river or a, or a pond. So one last thing I want to talk about in a, a landscape is the water lens. On a natural terrain without much human interaction, you'll see right about where the key point is, you'll see what's called a uh, water lens. And this is basically where runoff from rain or snow and direct rain will concentrate and start forming a saturation like a sponge. So with that saturation, 
and ex if you can keep that healthy and continually have water distribute in that section, it will eventually open up more, widen out, and it will interact with that groundwater and it will help continue that circuit. A lot of groundwater, especially in drier climates, may just be non-accessible without the proper hydrology. And to get that proper hydrology, we can do earthworks and planting and just careful management and make sure we're not eroding things and such. So here's the water lens. I'll get back to that. in our next segment on earthworks, but I want to ask some, have some questions asked if anyone has them before we go on. Yeah. Part of the reason to build swales to slow down the, the water so that it doesn't erode. So why, why would you start them below the inspection point rather than above the inspection point? The question was, why would you start if a, if a swale helps prevent erosion, why would you start it above, or uh, sorry, below it, uh, inflection point as opposed to above it? Well, you can actually start it anywhere. And, and if you do have some swales above that inflection point, it may be necessary. You may have to assess your land to see if there's erosive forces. There's our, there's our techniques you can use, I'll get into them but let's just focus on swales. Um, so this will help divert that water and spread it and, and stop that diversion, um, that erosion. But the point of, the key point, let's just mark it here, is that you're gonna have a large volume of water coming in because it's naturally settling in that point. So this is a good conduit, a good network to distribute as much water as possible on a landscape. So oftentimes when you're doing design like this, looking at the key point will help ensure you have them with the le least amount of labor and time distribute that water as effectively as possible. Yeah. Any more? Are this, I'm late, so Hi. the swales, are they are they the ditches with the uh, with, with the uh, with the uh, waffles? Well, I'm just going yeah. about to get waddles. into that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll explain okay. all. Waddles. Yeah, waddles. <laughs> I'll explain waddles, swales, ditches. Whales. See, you got to build all the swales and bring the whales, right? <laughs> I have a quick question. Yes. Could, could biochar be utilized to capture water more in these swales? Like if we had some extra char laying around and we want to get the swale going quicker, the biochar maybe speed the process up? So so the, the mediums of your soil really determine how what type of earthworks you're going to utilize. Okay. So if you incorporate biochar, you're asking for more pore space, you're asking for habitat for microorganisms, and you're also asking for some nutrient exchange. <laughs> and a lot of times with poor soil, something like biochar will help, you know, establish those plant communities, right? So in terms of absorbing water, if it's a degraded landscape, I think that it is a good technique that you can incorporate in your earthworks where, where the soil you've disturbed, and then that will help accelerate and maintain the network. Um, that brings me on one, con I've, I've kind of touched on it a bit, but plant communities hold water. They hold water, they keep it in reserve in the ground, as, as long with fungal and animal communities in the soil. So basically the more plants you have living and healthy, the more that water holds. And things like biochar, can help in really degraded landscapes in that respect. So, let's look at... Um, we biochar of a uh, nice organic crap from the fire that is like chopped up or something and 
Like a compost? More. It's it's basically it's basically this the charcoal here, except a lot of the compounds that inhibit like growth of like you know healthy fungus and bacteria are burned out. So wood oils kind of inhibit some of that growth, but basically biochar is wood burned in a special way so that it's a home for organisms to live and in especially in dry conditions that can help keep them hanging in there until some rain comes. I have a question. Yeah. So thinking about plant life and hydrology and maybe it's kind of circling a little bit back to the question about burning, but you know, if we're in a drought condition and we have a, a really wooded area, it seems like all of those plants might be competing for water in some way and the more density of plants actually might spread it out and all of them are drier then and none of them actually really get to be like a moisture holding thing. So maybe just help me. I'm trying to understand um, yeah. So, yeah, thinning versus like sharing water resources right. versus holding water in and I guess it's contextual. So there's definitely a balance involved. When we look at the imported eucalyptus, for example, the eucalyptus was brought here by farmers to basically dry up land. Mm -hmm. So like, they're like, I want farmland, but I've got a marsh, so I'm just going to plant a bunch of eucalyptus. Mm -hmm. Now eucalyptus hold a lot of water, but they also have a lot of volatile oils. Mm -hmm. One time I was driving farmer's market through um, Sepulveda, Sepulveda Pass during a fire, and I could so intense I could see these eucalyptus just combust mm -hmm. no fire was near them they just, went, they just, mm -hmm. they just mm -hmm. took off and they've got really strong oils so the, the issue then may be the density and the monoculture or basically single species mm -hmm. existing across landscape mm -hmm. if you increase the diversity mm -hmm. I erased my good diagram you have different root systems and you have different plant communities that compete for different nutrients. So if you, if you have a good biodiversity, as in many different types of not just plants, but you know fungus and animals and such, it helps mitigate that system where, oh, it's just a bunch of high burning stuff. So like in our landscape, we've got a lot of manzanita. We want to keep some of it. Manzanita is great for pollinators, great for food, not just for animals, humans as well. And, uh, but we have to thin some of that and plant diverse sure. species around it that have different nutrient needs and different plant needs. And hopefully nature does more of that for us. And we're already seeing that this is a very nice native habitat despite the fire. So yes, if, if you have a bunch of the same plant and it all dries out, that's a big trouble. But if you have different plants tapping at different elevations into the ground, extracting different water and nutrients, you know, they will help. The system. Yeah, they'll help mitigate that. Thanks, that was really helpful. <laughs> All right. Um, so let me talk a bit about applications. So the wattles and the swales. And I want to link it to our key concepts that I want everybody to memorize by the end of here. <laughs> <laughs> we got slow, slow spread, spread, sink. Sink. Three concepts it's or one? Three techniques for um, water. Holding. Holding or utilizing water. Okay. So with slow, what we're trying to do is lower the rate of that water to lower those erosive forces that cause damage. Slowing is one of the simplest earthworks techniques, barely, you don't even have to dig into the ground, that you can utilize. Low effort. Everyone is familiar with the waddles that's local. They're, they're, you see the green things with the straw wrapped around. That is slowing that water down so it's not creating the erosion. In the process of a waddle, slowing down water, it also infiltrates. It goes into the ground. As the water slows, it soaks more into the ground. 
So this isn't designed to hold water. This, the, the, the simple techniques such as a waddle and what's brought, been brought up earlier, the Hugel culture, which is German for wood culture. And, uh, right? Yeah, mounds, yeah, mound culture, thank you. And um, we actually have one right here. And we have several other examples. They're not designed to hold water because they'll decompose and then there'll be cavities and water can travel through it. So you never want to make a pond behind a waddle or a hugo culture. Or the third one, where we just simply take down brush and debris, get it nice and flat to the ground, and with, with the help of hydrology and plant communities, that breaks down. And when it breaks, as it's laying across a landscape, one thing I didn't mention, I'll get to it, when it's laying on contour, and I'll explain that in a moment, it will slow that water down, break down into usable materials for those plants to nourish themselves. And it will also raise that section a little bit as silt gets trapped behind it. So with runoff, we've got all these sediments and silts that and clays that collect. So slowing is the simplest and easiest technique that you can start right away. And a lot of landscapes, it's very applicable. So we got wattles, what's called wood swales, and um, Hugo culture. So for spreading, the idea is to spread across that water as far as you can. Now, if you concentrate water in one spot, that is good. That's good for that spot, right? So let me, let me show you an example with our fire alley. Let's say I'm allowing runoff or it's just naturally occurring and it's coming down this this ravine or gully, right? So it's going to create a stream or a seasonal creek or whatever. And it also build this water lens and with time again, it'll interact with that groundwater. A lot of times in ravines, the ground water is actually even higher. But in drier landscapes that you have to re you have to work on it. Now that's good, right? Because now this section has a lot of hydration, so it's harder to burn. However, these communities aren't quite getting that water, right? These plant communities, they're still relatively dry. So you may have a nice wet spot here, but because you've let it go and let it concentrate in one area, it's not really helping this and effectively you're still going to have those preheating conditions that create intense fires, right? However, if I spread it, the example of swales, if I spread swales and I put them along the landscape here, these will help bring that water, pull it up. Spreading that water because of how roots draw it up, you could defy gravity. You can, you can get this water with also water coming in this way to eventually create a nice lens that keeps all these plants nice and green and healthy through the summer. It takes time. None of this is overnight. Some of the easy techniques like in slow, you, you can obviously see dramatic results even within that season. But in terms of really building that water, it takes some effort. So spreading, we see several techniques. I want to focus on swales. Now, you can look at the map, the topo map. I forgot to mention all these lines, or maybe I did. They're called contours. So a contour is the level part of a, a hill or a rise or a mountain that is what's it's perpendicular to the slope. So as the slope goes downhill, it's basically 
staying along that level. So with, with level, with contours, you have level. And by basically taking an ex a swale, which is something that's built on that contour and is level, any water that infiltrates from this point, because it's level, as long as you don't have any obstructions, it will continue the entire way down. You could think of it as a really long stretched out dam in that respect. Another technique to get the water to the swales is a ditch, right? Everybody knows, pretty familiar with a ditch. So a ditch, the difference between a ditch and a swale is a ditch is on a slope. You want to continue that slope to move the water, to divert it. So there may be sections of your property you don't want too much water. A swale will concentrate that water and, and sink it down. Or maybe you need to get it over to a swale. The ditch solves those problems because it moves the water fast so it doesn't infiltrate too, fa too f easily. And then it, con it helps concentrate it in the rest of your earthworks. So I've talked about, what have I talked about? I've talked about slow, spread, and uh, sink, right? Sinking, you're sinking that water in the ground. The soil and the ground are the most efficient water storage systems you can have on any property. Why are they more efficient than a water tank or plumbing? Because like I said about plant communities before, it holds all that water in reserve until those plants need it. And as you bring it into the ground table and eventually the aquifers down below us, you've got a big reservoir and with healthy plant communities they can siphon it out when they need it. Storing water in the ground helps you prevent um, disasters. Say like, we have, we have um, gravity fed water from our well, but what happens if the tank breaks? Or if the line burns during a fire or something like that? Well, most of that's compromised. I can't get that water over there. But if, I, if I've already stored it in the ground, it's there in reserve. It's fail safe and it's ready for all those plants. So sinking has, there's different techniques you can use. Um, concentrating in ponds and reservoirs is one of the more frequent ones because not only can they sink that water, especially if they're not, if they have some um, porousness, as in the water can drain into it, not only do they sink that water in, they can also store. So if my water tank breaks, but I got a nice pond, I can just bring in a solar powered pump and then use it in the time being, right? Different ways of utilizing ponds and reservoirs are available. So depending on your soil, you may not be able to hold all that water, right? A lot of clay soils hold that water, but this is a very sandy soil here. And it does hold some water, but it will drain. But that is that really that bad if it's going into the soil? A lot of times when it's standing like this, especially in California, it's just going to evaporate into the air. If you've got some shade, that helps. But inevitably, getting it in the ground, it resists the evaporation, and then the plants only use it when they need it. One last thing I want to talk about is saturation. So we talked about the sponge, right? So soil saturates. It gets to a point where, like a sponge, you can't add more water to it, right? So if you have a good extended network, like, well, I kind of messed this one up, but <laughs> let's, say, uh, <laughs> let's say the saturation's here. It will go so far before it's fully saturated and then it'll start moving, right? So if we make different saturation zones at different elevations, we're basically filling the bank of water in that one spot so that it can move beyond it. 
So if we have more spots across the landscape, we can do that instead of one big concentrated pond or dam, like one down there, uh, we'll end up being able to distribute it more evenly and utilize our slow spread and sink. So any more questions on this? I appreciated you breaking it up in techniques of sp slow spread sink. That's helpful. Thank you. Yeah. So in summary, so this I'm, to help prevent the fires or keeping them less intense. Keeping them less intense, frankly, but mm -hmm. the more we work on it as a community, the more that intensity decreases. So you need a huge amount of these to make a difference. On your landscape, you can make a difference, at least. So, like, say, with planting the right species that can regenerate after a fire. So even if you have effects outside of your control, you can still provide a resiliency in your landscape. Even this property, if you look around the rest of it, there's more trees in this area than practically anywhere around. And that's because nature already did the work for us. But we don't, we've got some hubris here. Nature figured it out where they've concentrated water here and they've helped this community survive. And now we still have good, diverse native species. So I'm about out of time. I just wanted to summarize that by understanding fire and how it works with water, we can look at the landscape and see places that are best to distribute water and help prevent high intensity burns. We may get some low intensity. We may have to actually utilize prescribed burns to help with the health. The point is we really want to keep those conditions from going out of control. And with these techniques, you can do that. So would you, so in a perfect situation, you would build on top of the water lens and then build those little sink those around the mountain as well so you create that perfect environment in a perfect world that's what we would be doing you could think of it you could think of it like an islands where if you have those points you can you can expand them with plant communities things like willows they really draw that water and the the baccarus like mill fat and coyote bush they really draw that water spice bush and they um that way you can help distribute that water third so Think of it like islands where you have those saturation zones and spreading them out until they're all connected is, mm -hmm. is kind of what our design philosophy is here. So we're just trying to bring the water table up so we can Ideally, utilize yeah. it. Ideally, yeah. I've been doing a video, just real quick, I've been cutting a video that has um, Janelle's fiance, Matthew, the other Matthew, <laughs> Matthew Tremonet, and at one point he talks about how in this area, California used to have how many million beaver that yeah. lived here that eventually got brought down to just a few thousand mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it's i think about that a lot when we're talking about yeah. this i mean this is what they did so there's a, there's a lot of research involved in looking at books and papers and such but primarily what we're really focusing on is biomimicry mm -hmm. we want to be the beavers if there's no beavers i'd love to get the beavers back right. mm -hmm. there's beavers here there is. Hopefully they'll get up this elevation. That's wonderful. Yeah, I've seen some muskrat too. So if we can get those communities, help encourage them to come by maybe just doing a little bit of help, just a little bit of help with that, with that landscaping and so on, then they'll help do the work for us. That's the goal. We want that diversity. We want to emulate those patterns to invite them. I've been doing a lot of work for many years with prescribed burns of herbaceous plants, and I feel like that's a good way for me to introduce my community. Yeah, I, I definitely. Was, I was doing uh, herbaceous plants. Oh, oh. <laughs> the herbaceous. Yeah, I mean, it depends on the herbaceous. <laughs> like, <laughs> if, if Oh, gotcha. Uh, yeah. Sorry, we're a little slow. <laughs> yeah, I've been up since five. Thank you. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for this presentation. Now we're going to kind of break off a bit.